There's definitely value in practicing old arts. It brings you close to people who live before you. I think there's uh, importance in general of keeping old skills because we don't know what the future brings. Yeah, like these toboggan, one part that's nice about it is that they're really meant to last a lifetime. And so I know that generations, their kids and their kids and their kids can potentially be using these toboggans for a long time to come. It's satisfying to be doing something that's been going on since way before recorded history. Hello, I'm Tom Murphy. Welcome to Land and Sea. In our fast-paced world, antique stores are fun reminders of the way things used to be. As we move through constant change, new technology, new inventions, it becomes harder and harder to hold on to traditional ways of living and working. Yet there are Maritimers who are passionate about passing on and preserving skills and knowledge from the past. Horses love the chance to run free and graze in fields of endless green grass. The fresh air is good for them, but keeping these big animals healthy requires much more specialized care. Mike Spence has had his hands on horses' hooves since he was just a teenager. He had his own horse growing up. When he was 12, the man caring for his horse asked Mike if he wanted to help. And I said, sure and they put the shoe and he held it sort of in place and I got the nail in the hoof and I was hooked from then on. Uh, it's a passion and I like the finish work. I like the sort of the artwork of it and I love animals. Mike took on a traditional role as a farrier, a line of work that hasn't changed in centuries. You know, I'll have to fit it a little bit myself anyway. A farrier focuses attention on the legs and hooves and Mike Spence has lots of legs and hooves to keep him busy. He and his wife have five horses on their farm in Bay Verde, New Brunswick. A lot of times they go barefoot because a lot of it's woods, trails, and soft. I don't believe in shoeing a horse unless you need to shoe it, you know, unless you're doing something with it that needs shoes. Uh, other than that, we just trim them up. The all-important process starts with a cleaning. Mike then uses a nipper to trim the hoof. After the horse's hoof is trimmed, Mike flattens out any bumps or nicks with a rasp. Once the surface is smooth, the horse is ready for a new pair of shoes, a simple U-shaped metal flat all for the horse's safety and protection. We get on their backs and we spin them where they don't want to spin. We jump them over a six or eight foot fence. Uh, so obviously you got to have some good tires on your car if you're racing and you got to have good feet trimmed up or your feet trimmed up well and good shoes put on. The shoes vary depending on what surface the horse is on and their activity. Like a jumper has to have shoes with some grip in it, uh, a different kind of grip than um, a quarter horse that's running after cattle or doing reining, stops, spins. Mike Spence knows all about what horses need to stay healthy on their legs, but there's only a few of his breed left. He hopes his trade won't be lost over time. I'm a dinosaur, so, you know, I'm coming to the end of my line. So I love to pass on whatever I've gained. So a few years ago, Mike decided to pass on his know-how to someone who shares his love of horses. He started training his wife, Mary Thompson. It's, it means a lot for me to pass on what I know uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons. And Mary's just somebody that really is uh, into making people happy and making horses happy. When I was a teenager, I decided I was going to get myself a horse, but um, we live on a 20-acre piece of woodland. So my father said, okay, if you want a horse, you got to clear a piece of land. So I started clearing land, went off to summer camp and kind of forgot about it. <laughs> so, so now I'm kind of picking up where I left off there and there's always a time for everything. So it's my time to be with horses now. Mike adjusts every shoe to make sure it fits the horse perfectly. 
So now I'm just going to widen the toe out a little bit. Just give it one little smuck with the, with the things just to widen it out and then we've got to grind it and then it's good to go. They use a forge to heat the metal, then shape out the shoe on an anvil. Um, it's, it's a puzzle. You uh, look at a horse and try to figure out, you know, what the best option is for that horse for shoeing and pick out the shoes, shape them up, um, grind them, make them look nice, uh, polish up the hoof. And so it's, it's a science and an art and that's, that's what I like about it. Okay, let's try this on. Clips are bent in. Yeah. I'm just doing a rough idea. That looks good. So when that goes on hot, that should slide back there to his heel just about right. You get a few nails in there. Quite a bit of grinding on the inside. Okay. No buckles or laces to keep the shoe secure. They're nailed right onto the hoof, and any sharp edges are filed down with the rasp. Mike Spence and Mary Thompson have plenty to do on their own farm, but horse health is a priority for the pair. So all week long, they take their old style skill on the road. Today, they're heading to Galloway Stables in Port Howe, Nova Scotia. Mary and I travel three provinces. We do New Brunswick, some in Nova Scotia, some New Brunswick, and some in Prince Edward Island. We usually work on uh, probably at least 50 horses a week. Their truck is fully equipped with everything a traveling farrier needs. Horseshoes, an onboard forge, and a portable anvil. Bobby Halverson feels lucky to have Mike and Mary visit. She's Galloway's stable manager with 12 horses under her care. Well, farriers like priceless like if you don't have good feet on your horse you don't have a horse These horses can feel how you feel and um, if you're nervous around them that makes them nervous so it's really important to have a farrier who is nice and calm and um, assertive you have to have a really good farrier and a good team to keep those horses happy Mike has been the farrier at Galloway Stables since it opened in 1999. I have a, a pretty good way with animals, I believe, and uh, the animals have no gray areas when you're trying to deal with them. Benson, has a, he's a big heavy horse. He has a fairly flat foot. In other words, he doesn't have a lot of protection on the bottom of his foot. So we put a shoe on for that reason. Mike knows the horses here well, and they remember him too, because of his regular visits. He and Mary are here to trim them up every six weeks. So trimming, uh, you can balance them up like a tire on a car. You can take a little off this side, you can take a lot of toe off, so it makes them easier to take a step. So trimming is necessary today a lot because we tend to ride them in uh, different conditions, so you don't want them breaking off. And you got to remember people are on their backs, so you don't want them tripping. So trimming keeps it short, like a nice tight shoe on your foot. I guess this horse is ready to go, Bobby, so you can take him out. In modern times, this old-fashioned trade still has a vital place in stables all over the Maritimes. Machines might one day do the job, but for her horses, Bobby Halverson favors the human touch of a farrier. In this day and age, having a farrier is still very important. If you don't have a good qualified farrier, um, your horse could end up with serious leg issues. It's like a little team when you have a horse. You have your farrier, your vet, um, your coach, all your stable mates. How do they look? Not done for a while. No, I don't think so. <laughs> and the farrier is like the root of it all. And I hope that we always have good farriers. I like it as much today as I did when I started. And uh, yeah, I just love it. Coming up on Land and Sea, old fashioned toboggan making connects people to their favorite winter pastime. The idea of being able to make something out that brings enjoyment to kids and to people, something that really was appealing to me.
What fun a snow-covered hill can offer in winter. The word toboggan likely conjures up all kinds of wonderful memories for Canadians about childhoods spent speeding down slopes. And while the old-fashioned slider creates nostalgia for some, for Dan Peacock, the traditional sled is all about creating new memories and building a present-day connection to the past. When I first got into toboggan making, I really thought about the history of it all and long before Europeans ever came to North America there was a canoe and there's toboggan and these were main forms of transportation for the people who lived here back then so they know that, they, that what I'm doing now it sort of has a history that goes even back before Canada it's really something special to me. Dan combines his love of history the outdoors and crafting functional items out of wood his business is called Canoe Shelburne, where he fixes canoes and builds old-fashioned toboggans. They always say, find what you love to do and do it, and find a way to make a living at it. So that's the, sort of the direction I took. He's based in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, but Dan's memories of sledding take him back to a different maritime community. I grew up in Bathurst, New Brunswick, and we had a great hill by home called Tower Hill. So we, as a kid, we used to always run out with, the, with our toboggans, and man, you go down that hill, and lots, and we really enjoyed it. So um, the idea of being able to make something that, that brings enjoyment to kids and to people is something that really was appealing to me. Wooden toboggans are heavier than plastic ones, so they steer well. And because they're made of strong, natural materials, they're comfortable and durable. Dan says every wooden piece he shapes is with the hope of putting a smile on the face of a sledder. I generally don't always make a toboggan until I have a name to go along with it. So that when I'm working on this toboggan, I know who it's for and I know how they're going to use it. So I, and I know that they're going to be able to keep it for a long time because they're really meant to last generations, really. I really just think of those fun winter days and all the fun I had as a kid. Uh, going to sliding where we invite the whole community out and it just a, makes for a lot of winter fun instead of just staying inside all day. Dan's wife Dorothy helps with steaming and staining the pieces that are used to form the sled's curved seat. I really want to start with all local products and local materials as much as I can get. So I start by going to some of the local sawmills around looking for good lumber that I can use for these projects. Uh, bring it in, I, I saw it, mill it all up into the proper sizes I need. Well, typically when I make a toboggan, it's always made out of ash or oak, uh, depending on what I can get available locally from my, from my couple different sawmills that I go to around southern Nova Scotia. It takes about five days to finish a toboggan. This year, Peacock has made 35 classic sleds. Every piece he uses is high quality and meant to withstand the harshest winter weather. The last piece that goes on is the tow rope that goes around. But this, is, this one here is sort of here for kids to grab a hold of and as you're going down the hill. And Once the rope is secured, the wooden toboggan is ready to hit the hills. Again, it's all about the memories you create growing up. Um, I, I can I look back whenever I was a kid and all the fun I had with toboggans and it you know create the same memory for my kids and for grand for grand for people's grandkids and nieces and nephews and friends and just about having fun and enjoying life. So there, this one is ready for Jack. Nice to meet you. Jack Schwartz drove two hours from Halifax to meet Dan and pick up a toboggan as a gift. I've got two granddaughters that are gonna love this. Well, that's good. I'm sure they'll get a lot of use out of it. Oh, great. Thanks again. You're welcome. Okay. Winter lovers appreciate Dan Peacock's dedication to his traditional craft. After all, his mission couldn't be more Canadian, to encourage the simple enjoyment of snow, now and well into the future. Yeah, like these toboggan, one part that's nice about it is that they're really meant to last a lifetime. And so I know that generations, their kids and their kids and their kids, can potentially be using these toboggans for a long time to come. Coming up on Land and Sea, more old ways in new times. The charming evolution of spinning. It's satisfying to be doing something that's been going on since way before recorded history. That was fundamental to human ability to survive on this planet.
On Nova Scotia's eastern shore, in the tranquil community of Jador, there's a loft overlooking the harbor where an ancient art is kept alive. Leslie Hawk has been spinning for almost 40 years. So I like making things um, in a very elemental way. And spinning has a magic kind of element to it, which people are always fascinated when they're watching me. And they see this ball of fur, and then suddenly it's on the wheel and it's like, it's gone from there to, the, to yarn in, in a flash of a second, and it's, it's magic. Spinning is basically taking fibers, all kinds of different fibers, and twisting them. That's spinning. And spinning has been around for a long, long time. It's satisfying to be doing something that's been going on since way before recorded history that was fundamental to human ability to survive on this planet. I think it's important to know where we came from, you know, in all kinds of parts of human existence, like things that humans do, to know the history of it. Um, it goes back pretty darn far because we don't know when it, people first started spinning. It's prehistory. Uh, I love antiques and to find the tools that come from the last couple of centuries and be able to use them, and, and they're useful, still useful. Um, is, is really fun, interesting, and satisfying. Fibers were first spun with tools called digging sticks. Uh, from a historical perspective, this would have been the first uh, supported spindle that would have come out of a digging stick, a very simple tool. From digging sticks, spinners went on to develop drop spindles. This is a more modern development of a drop spindle, which people still use today. The tools vary, and so do the choices of fiber. Leslie Hawk has turned all kinds of material on her wheel. Sheep's wool, mohair, hemp, and flax. Even dog hair can be spun into yarn. So this machine is a hand, it's called a triple picker. What it's doing is pulling these uh, opposing uh, very sharp nails are separating all the fibers uh, apart. And when it comes from the fleece, it's all curly and sort of stuck together. This opens up the fibers, separates them, gets them ready for carding. The carding process straightens the fibers. They're combed in one direction and brushed over short nails and hooks. That's the first step in the process of making yarn. <laughs> so after carding is the spinning. So sitting down with a wheel or a drop spindle and um, using the tool that you have at hand to put twist into that fiber. And as it, it's elongated, stretched out, and the twist happens and then it becomes strong. It, it's an experience and it gets us in touch with, also with um, our ancestry, that we're here because people over time, our ancestors going back hundreds of years, were living, you know, hard scrabble lives and had a spinning wheel or a drop spindle and made blankets and made socks and, gloves and mittens and things so they could keep living. Leslie Hawk is keen to pass on this old world skill. She offers workshops for anyone interested in giving the wheel a whirl. Let's look at some examples of balanced and unbalanced yarn. Kate Sowiak is one of Leslie's students. So Kate had an antique spinning wheel before. passed down to her by a friend yarn. and she wanted to try her hand at the craft. I've definitely always been attracted to spinning. I think it just looks like a fun thing to do, as well as like I love farming and the animal and taking the fur from an animal and turning it into something that you can wear. It's like sharing. Or spin a little bit and then we'll ply it and we'll check for the balance. Remember that part? Yep. Spinning is very good therapy. It takes your mind 
into other places while you trottle along. It's very meditative. Next time, what you have to do is go slower and be checking it a little more frequently. But that looks good. Is. I think that looks really, really nice. Looks good. You got, you certainly got the camel in there nicely. Does it matter when you're using it if it has that twist in it? It does matter because if you knit with that, it'll skew. Uh, the twists matter, uh, and for people like Leslie and Kate, so do traditional skills. Without their interest and passion for spinning, this ancient art would be lost, and so would meaningful connections to the past. When I got my spinning wheel, I didn't notice at first, but the treadle where you put your foot has been worn down, so it's got like the fossil of a the great-grandmother who used to use it. There's a sort of self-sufficiency about it, in a sense, but it's also fun. I would hope it would have a place in our culture for a long time. As long as there are enthusiastic Maritimers passing on and preserving traditional knowledge, these old-style trades and crafts will carry on, and deep historical and cultural roots will continue to grow. There's definitely value in practicing old arts. It brings you close to people who lived before you.